planets at Bernard Star, Chinese lunar spacesuits. Voyager 2 has to power down one of its instruments and a comet seen from space. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Hello from Iceland. I'm on the road again, but we're continuing to record Space Bites and other content. So enjoy this week's Space News. So first up, we've got a planet discovered around Bernard Star. Bernard Star is the second closest star system to the sun. I think I got all of that very technically correct. This is a red dwarf star that's about six light years away from Earth. And back in 2018, astronomers announced that they had discovered an exoplanet at Bernard Star, and everybody was quite excited about this. And then they had to retract the announcement other people weren't able to find evidence that the planet existed, and so then we thought that there were no planets around Bernard Star. But now, astronomers once again have announced that they have found a planet around Bernard Star. And not just one planet, maybe a hint of an additional three planets. The planet has about half the mass of Venus, but it orbits the star about every three days, so it is well inside the habitable zone. It's about 125 Celsius on its surface, so way too hot for it to have liquid water on the surface. But then there are these other additional planets. There's just a hint of a signal of them. Now, the planet was discovered using the Espresso instrument on board the Very Large Telescope, and this is like one of the most powerful planet hunting instruments that astronomers have on the ground. They were able to measure the gravitational wobbles back and forth of the star as the planets were orbiting around it. This is the radial velocity method. And then other astronomers used other observatories to confirm the existence of this planet. So at this point, it's pretty certain, and you feel pretty confident that now we know that there are planets around Proxima Centauri and probably many planets around Bernard Star. Like planets are everywhere. A strange lopsided planet. Speaking of exoplanets, astronomers have found a very bizarre lopsided planet orbiting around the star WASP-107. Now the planet is about the size of Jupiter, but it has one-tenth the mass of Jupiter. It orbits very close, and so it's tidally locked to the star. Astronomers were able to measure the atmosphere of the planet with James Webb as it was passing directly in front of the star from our perspective. And what they found was that the thickness of the atmosphere on one side of the planet is different than the thickness of the atmosphere on the other side of the planet. So it's kind of warped, lopsided. The planet is tidally locked to the star. And so you can imagine that there should be a certain amount of difference in the thickness of the atmosphere on the side that is facing the star versus the side that is away from the star but you're also seeing this side to side, and that was very confusing. And like, maybe this is the way they all are. You know, this is like the first planet they were able to measure the thickness of the atmosphere with that level of accuracy. It could be that all tidally locked hot Jupiter planets have this lopsided nature, or maybe this is just a one-off with something very bizarre happening. Crew Dragon can make a propulsive landing. So SpaceX Crew Dragon, is the way that astronauts are getting to and from the International Space Station. And when it's time for Crew Dragon to come home, it detaches from the station, plunges through the Earth's atmosphere, and then it opens up these four parachutes and it lands softly in the ocean off the coast of Florida. But what happens if all four parachutes fail? All is not lost. Crew Dragon has a plan. NASA and SpaceX announced that they're gonna be implementing an emergency propulsive landing if all four of the parachutes fail. So it's got these super Draco engines that it can fire. So it will orient itself as it's going towards the ground. If all the parachutes have failed, just before it hits the ocean, it will fire these super Draco thrusters, come to roughly a stop, and then land gently in the ocean. And so this is great. I mean, this provides another layer of safety for the astronauts as they're coming home from the International Space Station. The view from Polaris Dawn. So we've been doing a lot of reporting for the last couple of weeks about the Polaris Dawn mission. This is the private tourist spacecraft that flew with four private astronauts. They did a spacewalk. Now they had a camera on top of Polaris Dawn that was filming the planet Earth for a big chunk of the mission. And so this week SpaceX released a compilation 
of views out of the top of the Polaris Dawn spaceship. And it's beautiful. I mean, you can just see the curvature of the Earth. You can see various features on the Earth, auroras, clouds, as the spacecraft is going around and around the Earth. Not much more to say, just a, a beautiful video. China unveils its lunar spacesuits. As we've been reporting, China is planning on sending humans to the moon by 2030. And that's getting pretty close. And so this week, they revealed what their new spacesuits look like. And they look very familiar to the lunar spacesuits that were worn by the Apollo program, but there's a lot of modern features that these things have with an additional 60 years of technology. So these things have built-in cameras, They've got a new kind of fabric that protects the astronauts from the temperature and the lunar dust. There's a control console that sits on their chest that they can manage with their gloves. And the overall style of the suit is supposed to sort of draw on the design of Chinese armor. Very cool, it just shows that they are continuing to move forward to landing people on the moon. Now we've got a couple more missions that are gonna come from China before they attempt this. So we're gonna see a sample return mission in 2026. We're gonna see a mission attempt to make resources from the surface of the moon in 2028. And then they're building a new heavy lift rocket, a new lunar lander system, and a new capsule. And all these should come together and hopefully they're gonna be able to make their attempt in 2030 cracks on the International Space Station. Another of these stories that we have been following, and this is that there are these cracks on the International Space Station that are losing air. And specifically, they're on a module, a tunnel, that connects the Russian part of the space station to a docking port. And back in February, the amount of atmosphere that the International Space Station was losing was about 500 grams a day. So like about a pound of atmosphere is just going out of the station and into space. But now they're up to about 1.5 kilograms of atmosphere a day, about three pounds that is just escaping through cracks in this tunnel and going out into space. And so NASA has taken this issue, which was a fairly low level concern and put it pretty much to the top of the things that they're nervous about. And so, you know, right now we don't know what these cracks are. We don't know what's causing them and it's increasing. It's sort of showing you that the space station is starting to show its age, and it might be that they're gonna to have to start knocking pieces of the station away to prevent this further atmosphere loss. And it just shows you that they're gonna to have to take this a lot more seriously. They're gonna to have to either figure out exactly what's causing the leaks, or they're going to have to supply the station with more atmosphere to make up for the amount that it's losing. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best space news story. And the winner this week was the strange black and white rock found on Mars. So thank you everybody who voted. Now we post the vote within 24 hours. You can find it in the community tab, but if you're just scrolling on YouTube, you should see the vote pop up. Of course, the best way to make it happen is to subscribe to our channel click on the notifications bell, and then watch a bunch of our videos to train the YouTube algorithm that you wanna see more of our stuff, especially these votes. And like once you've voted once, they'll just show up every week. NASA turns off one of Voyager 2's science instruments. The Voyager spacecraft have been around for a long time. They launched in 1977. They have been in space for more than 40 years, almost 50 years, yeah. They've been in space for almost 50 years, and they're powered by a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. This is a chunk of decaying plutonium, and plutonium has a half-life, and so over time, the amount of heat that is being produced by this plutonium is going down, and so the amount of electricity that they can generate from that heat is going down. And over time, NASA has had to shut off the various instruments on board the Voyagers. And so this week, NASA had to make the decision to shut off another one of Voyager 2's instruments. And so the one they shut off this week is the plasma science experiment. And this is an instrument on board Voyager that measures plasma particles as they are sweeping past Voyager. It can detect how much of them are going by and their direction. And this is very useful because Voyager is out in the interstellar space outside of the sun's heliosphere, and it's trying to measure the amount of plasma that's going by in interstellar space. Now, Voyager 2 still has four science experiments running, but NASA thinks that by the 2030s, they're gonna have to bring that down to probably just one science experiment. So 
like I, I keep saying this, but like emotionally prepare yourself for the day when they have to shut down the last of the science experiments on the Voyagers and then they will be done. And then they'll be off waiting for the aliens to pick them up and then bring them home and that's how you get V'gers. Space Balloon completes a test flight. All right, this is one of the things that I am most excited about. It's a company called Space Perspective. And what they are planning is tourist balloon flights that go to the edge of space. And so instead of like flying in a small rocket and getting a little bit of weightlessness for a few minutes, you're up at 30 kilometers altitude, above 99% of the atmosphere, where you can see the curvature of the Earth in this cushy capsule where you can sit, there's comfortable seats, there's a toilet, and you can really appreciate what it looks like to be above the Earth. And so last month, they tested out their capsule. It's called the Neptune Excelsior, and it's designed to go up to that 30 kilometers altitude. And so they did a test, launched it, it went up to the altitude, its pressure remained stable, and it was able to hang properly at that altitude. And then six hours later, came back down, landed softly in the ocean off the coast of Florida, and then it was recovered. So the company is one step closer to actually being able to take paying passengers to the edge of space. So tickets cost $125,000, and they have well over a thousand people who have already signed up. But hopefully by 2025, they'll start to be able to run those flights and take people up to that height. And I, I, I think, you know, like if I had to choose between going on, say, uh, New Shepard, or Virgin Galactic or going on space perspectives, I would take the balloon ride. A black hole beam seen by Hubble. So we know that there is this giant beam that is blasting out of the galaxy M87. This is the galaxy that had the supermassive black hole where we got an image of the event horizon taken by the event horizon telescope. And so like we know a lot about this galaxy. We know about this beam that is coming out. But now astronomers have used Hubble data and realized that there are novae going off near where this beam is blasting out into space. And like, that's really weird. Like a nova is when you've got a binary star system, you've got a white dwarf star that is feeding on a companion star, piling up material, reaches a certain point, it explodes on the surface, then the process starts all over again. Why would a jet of material that is coming out of a supermassive black hole somehow trigger novae nearby? And so astronomers aren't entirely sure. One possibility is that the jet is pushing hydrogen gas out into space in the sort of larger area around it. This is piling onto these white dwarf stars and triggering those nova explosions. Another possibility is that that beam is somehow causing the stars to inflate. And so they're able to provide more material to the white dwarf star. But still, it's like a mystery. Like why are white dwarf stars piling up more material on the surface and detonating when they could be thousands of light years away from this beam that's going off into space? It's a puzzle. Finally, I want to show you a really cool image of the comet Tsuchinshin Atlas. And this is the comet that everybody is talking about, the one that is expected to brighten up about over the next week or so and become visible with the unaided eye. And there's an astronaut on board the International Space Station, Matthew Dominic, and he took his camera and pointed it out the window and took a picture of the comet as it was just above the horizon of the Earth. And he also was able to see auroras across the surface of the Earth. It's a beautiful picture. And this is what we might be able to see. Well, maybe not the auroras and not the curvature of the Earth, but we might be able to see this comet with our own eyes in the next couple of weeks. Now, I'm gonna give you some more advice about how to see the comet of the century. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Barry Lake Roofing, David Giltana, David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Matter, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Rohrbach, scienceworldrecord.org, spiderswap.io, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Chiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. You're gonna hear a lot over the coming week about this comet, Comet A3. And I mean, we don't know if it's going to perform and be the brightest comet that we've seen in many decades, but there's a really good chance that it's gonna be very good. And so I wanna sort of explain how you can be able to see it. So right now, when we're recording this, until about October 3rd, the comet is visible in the pre-dawn sky and it's best seen from the Southern Hemisphere. So if you wanna try, look to the east about an hour before sunrise and you might be able to see the comet. But the comet is then gonna go behind the sun 
until it reemerges around October the 11th. And it's gonna be at its brightest point on probably October 12th and visible now in the evening sky and also very visible from people in the Northern Hemisphere. And to be able to sort of figure out where to look, you're gonna to wanna to be able to find Venus, which is fairly close to the horizon in the evening sky at about the same level as where the comet is going to appear. You can have Venus, and then a little to the right of Venus, you're gonna have where the comet is. But like if the comet is bright, it should be very obvious. So the point is just find Venus, look to the west after sunset. And then over the course of the next few days, the comet is going to rise and be higher and higher in the sky, but it's also probably going to worsen. So the tail is gonna get less bright, tail is gonna not be as long, and so the view to it is just gonna decrease over time. So the best time to see it is gonna be probably October 12th, and then through till about the 18th, it'll still look amazing, and then it will slowly dim and will raise higher and higher in the sky night after night after night. So on October 12th, go out, look to the west, and hopefully you'll be able to see the brightest comet that we've seen in decades. Or a complete and total disappointment, because that's how comets are. Don't get your hopes up. They just break your heart every time. All right, we'll see you next week.